my mother was already quite far gone in her dementia and a well-meaning family friend went to visit her and to tell her the news. Protection from grief in the dementia ward. Told about her son's funeral, she replies, I think you're mistaken. You have the surname wrong. How her madness growls, wards off grief. Not all deaths in the um, reports of death in the dementia ward are received as unwelcome news. Widowhood in the dementia ward. Oh my God, I'm so pleased to see you, she says from her nest of blankets. I've been meaning to ask, how is your father? How is Paddy? He died, I say, remembering 1974. Good heavens, now you tell me. How lucky he is. You could join him, I suggest. I didn't like him that much, she replies. <laughs> My mother's um, descent into dementia had begun several years before, and uh, what I found fascinating, um, both during the time we cared for her at home and, and later in the years in frail care, was the sense of witnessing the remnants of a great edifice, the great edifice of her personality that was being eroded by the dementia, the fact that it was still visible somehow through the madness. At 85, my mother's mind. When she wanders from room to room, looking for someone who isn't there, when she asks where we keep the spoons, when she can't chew and spits out her food, when her last dim light flickers with falling ash and she exclaims, what a dismal end to a brilliant day, when she calls her regular laxative an astronaut, when she can't hear words but fears sound, when she says, don't go, I can't bear it when you go, or just run me off the cliff, or wants to know how many dyspran ends it. Then I think how, at 85, my mother's mind is a castle in ruin. Time has raised her drawbridge, locked her bastions, her balustrade is crumbled, and she leans. Yet still you may walk these ramparts in awe. Sometimes, when she speaks, the ghostly ensign flies. Time cannot hide what once stood here or its glory. Do not think that we are good or merely tourists. That which detains us was once our fortress. Death, divorce, having a baby, all of these can cause you to teeter you can also combine all three if you like. <laughs> Wanting to get divorced, number 1,365. After the measles and whooping cough jabs, our daughter was restless and tearful, reaching screeching point on the baby rack. You were looking forward to your vichyssoise, but I said bluntly, we have to take her home. In the dark car, while she slept with still shuddering breath, you told me that our baby, at nine months old, was selfish and willful. She had knowingly performed. You resented her and the lack of soup. You wanted your old life back. You wondered whether you shouldn't drop us in the dark driveway and dine alone in some elegant, baby-free place. I said, yes, go eat, go eat a lot. Try to fill the vacuum where your soul used to be. <laughs> Fifteen years later, thin and coughing, your once deep voice now high and girlish, you asked, 
forgive me. I have done you wrong. And I said, there is nothing to forgive. Because I don't want to forgive you. I want you to come back as a mother. I think that children are very good at intuiting meaning. And this poem, I Am Zebra, comes from a moment of illumination that came to me when I was five or six years old at one of those pageants that parents and teachers arrange for children. Parents want to see their children displayed. Children are too young to learn any serious words. And so they are just put on, on display. I am the zebra. We each had to say who we were, and then it was the next girl's turn. If this reminds you of life, then you're dead right. I am the lion, claimed the tallest girl in a reedy falsetto. Somewhere on the Serengeti, a lion raised a shaggy brow and showed his pride a sceptical tooth. I am the elephant, admitted a plump girl, pinkly, with no hide at all. Somewhere on the Serengeti, a war-torn elephant ear flapped in irritation. And so it went, down the road. Parents strained to hear the genteel, yeah. the civil, yeah. the mild, buffalo, and of course, the unobtrusive, <laughs> I was the smallest. Sickness had put me off my food. But I had the voice of a seventh child, and I knew what this was all about. I am the zebra, I called out. I called out for the quacker, for the muzzled, for all browsers, for the small, for the ungulate, for the hunted, for the herd. I am the zebra. And though the audience laughed, such a small girl with such a big bark. Somewhere on the Serengeti, my courageous vegetarian kin looked up and nodded. Thank you very much.